Good morning. Welcome to Georgetown University. My name is John Mayo. I am a professor of economic business and public policy in the Dennis School of Business. And I'm also the executive director of the Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy, which is today's host for us. Uh, this event this morning is part of a year long series in which the center is engaged in both a retrospective and a forward looking uh, look at the evolution of regulation, the evolution of regulation. And it's really motivated by two concerns, the two issues. Number one, there is, it turns out, a great deal of learning that happened, has happened, and is happening in the academic community on the causes and consequences of regulation. That learning is an ongoing process, and we feel as if we might be able to bring that learning from the academic community here to Georgetown, here to Washington, D.C., to showcase the very best learning from the academic community in an audience that includes not only the academics, but also business people, policy makers, and, and regulators. I think that's a, a real opportunity for us. The second motivation for the series is an observation that we have, but it's not really unique to Georgetown, and not unique to our center. And that is all too often, all too often, especially perhaps here in Washington, discussions of progress and changes on, on regulation and the deregulation process are couched within ideological terms. And what it means is that the beginning and the end of discussions sometimes regarding regulation are, are set within ideological discussions. And that discussion is unsettling from an economist anyway for at least two reasons. Number one, if the debate is set within an ideological an ideological context, it will tend to create inertia. Inertia is that will cycle incremental but positive changes in the regulatory process, in the regulatory process. Uh, and yet as at our opening event that some students in the White House noted incremental changes, incremental changes in the regulatory process and the regulatory process can create significant, large benefits for consumers and for regulated firms and for their economy as a whole. The second reason that ideology becomes a bit troubling if it is seen as the driver of the, ideology, of the regulatory process is that ideology is effectively non discriminating. It paints all industries with the, and all firms with the same ideological breadth. And what that means is that as the ideological kingdom inevitably swings from, from one end of the ideological and political spectrum to the other, we as a society will err. In one or two ways, we will err either in a period of uh, deregulation to, to, to have under-regulation of firms that require, for the public good, more overt regulation, to erring on the other side in periods of ideological tendencies toward regulation of over-regulating firms that would with very light touch or no touch regulation, perform very, very well. So for both those reasons, ideology is very, very costly. And you'd like to have a regulatory process and regulatory system that avoids and achieves that regulatory ideology. Now, in light of those observations, we at the center have begun this process over the last year of looking at the evolution of regulation and to try to discern what is the best of regulatory process. And when we look back at that process, what we find is that the very best, the very best of regulation has come about in the form of what we refer to as results-based regulation. 
results-based regulation. The results-based regulation occurs when policymakers and regulators work not to ideology, but instead work to analytical and empirical tools to assess the merits of regulation and perspective regulation. In such a world, both the presence of and the stringency of rules and regulations in any particular industry will depend on the cold, hard, analytical assessment of how economic welfare will be affected under policies ranging from wage fair to light tax regulation to more direct regulatory approaches. Now, a more complete description of the principles of the tax based regulation and our thinking on this will be available at the end of this uh, discussion, either on the left or right. A uh, paper copy will be available, as will be uh, 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 the paper online at the center. Now, I mention all of this because it is against this background that in January of this year, President Obama issued an executive order in which he required executive agencies to examine existing rules and regulations to see if they may be outdated, ineffective, insufficient, or excessively burdensome. And based on their review, the executive agencies have been called upon by the president to modify, streamline, or repeal unnecessary regulations that are inconsistent with the goals of effective and efficient regulatory practice. Now, very importantly, this appeal is not an appeal based on ideology. Uh, or ideological grounds, but rather the president has asked the agencies to use modern analytical tools and economic methods to assess the economic effectiveness of existing rules and regulations and the relative benefits and costs of those regulatory changes. So, in short, this sort of effort that is being undertaken is very consistent with what we have found as being consistent with the very best of regulatory practice that is results-based regulation. As a follow-up to the initial January order, President Obama in July issued a second executive order calling on the independent regulatory agency, such as the Federal Communications Commission, to engage in a similar exercise to review existing regulatory practices and rules and to modify or, where warranted, to eliminate outmoded, ineffective, insufficient, or excessively burdensome regulations. Now, while the effort to modernize the regulatory process and the deregulatory process by eliminating outdated rules and regulations is generally very important in the economy, I cannot imagine a single industry in which it is more important than in today's telecommunications and communications industry. This is a sector of the economy that has been the poster child of economic vitality and innovation in an economy that has otherwise labored to produce economic growth in recent years. It is by all accounts a very fast-paced, dynamic industry and one where the benefits, where the benefits of a retrospective review of its regulatory rules and policies and practices are likely to bear very real and tangible economic benefits. Benefits for consumers, for the regulatory agencies themselves, for the firms that are under the purview of the regulatory agencies, and for the economy as a whole. Now, for that reason, it gives me a special pleasure today to be here to uh, introduce to you the chairman of the Federal Communications Commission, uh, Gary. Julius Pinakowski, who will review for you and to describe for you the efforts of the month long process under which the FCC has engaged in its retrospective analysis of, of its regulatory rules and uh, procedures. Please help me welcome the chairman of the FCC, Julius Pinakowski. Thank you. Uh, very nice. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be here for a uh, few days. Lately, as a reminder, this is a house in a hospital parking garage. And it's been through that uh, 20 years ago, last week, my son was born for the first time. 
this guy goes. Um, we wonder whether the year, uh, because of what the, the genocide of the uh, central provision of public policy has been doing. Uh, too often, uh, public policy and business are regarded as completely separate uh, in them. Uh, it's a very constructive, healthy thing that this country is focused on analyzing and thinking about the relationship between public policy uh, in any business. Uh, certainly, in terms of the private sector, it's exactly what you would uh, want. Um, and as you indicated in your remarks, uh, they're not always predictable. The important thing is the commitment to fact based, open minded uh, analysis of the clear articulation of goals uh, in smart focus on the providers to achieve So, it's a particular type of individual of this country talking about this topic. Uh, I noticed that it's been very beautiful that there are a couple of people here from the SEC, as we just mentioned, and just the Hamid, so we started to include uh, these and that have been very involved in the topics I'll be talking about today that are among the best in the world at the SEC and the reason uh, we've been able to get uh, a lot done uh, to help drive our economy and lead technology and innovation for the benefit of all Americans. Um, I'm just going to give you the to talk this morning about our efforts to reform the SEC. So, this tool, the agency for the digital agent, to remove barriers in our regulation to private investment, innovation, and job creation. So, as you can you may be wondering, uh, as you get this question a lot, what exactly does the SEC do? So, on the left side of the SEC, is an agency that's expert in the um, communications technology and services. In the U.S., the FTC does what in some other countries three or four agencies do. In those countries, there is a, an agency that handles wired communications, wired telephone service, or increasingly broad internet. Another agency handles wireless communications, like mobile phones. Another handles media, like TV or cable. Another thing was content issues. Maybe we have another that handles international issues, that are international content. In the United States, thanks to the internet, Herbert Hoover, we have one agency responsible for all the years. And in fact, you can see the FTC logo on the back of uh, your phone. You can go ahead and check. Uh, or your tablet, or your TV. Now, I'm not sure that when the FTC was created, uh, that Commerce Secretary of the Union, the Commerce Secretary of the Union, uh, for Swatch, they converged world. A world in which technology allows all text, all voice, audio, and video to travel and do more bits across all platforms, wired and wireless. So today, having a single agency that can create coherent policies across these platforms, gives the U.S. the potential competitive advantage over our global competitors in the international digital marketplace. That's why the Chief Education Chairman in 2009 has worked to put the agency on the communications platform of today and tomorrow, wired and wireless broadband internet. And it's why I've made clear that the SEC's mission is to promote innovation and investment across the critically important platform, harnessing the power of communications technology to grow our economy. Create jobs and help U.S. competitive and power consumers in a broad opportunity and a higher quality of life for all Americans. By the government, as I mentioned from the decade in the private sector as an executive and investor, as my first day as chairman, I've spoken about something I learned in the private sector that an organization's ability to embrace its mission depends on how it does its work. We live in a world imagined by Peter, by Bill Gates, by Mark Anderson, by the visionaries, but in human ways, the SEC rules the processes are inherited were built for the world by the underground bell. So I have made agency reform a top priority. When I first asked the chairman to appoint a special counsel for SEC reform, we did not have someone focusing on anything every day or what we did with them. 
And what is the first step the goal of making the FCC a model of that same together? I directed her on such a policy to lead an agency-wide effort to the hard and currently at our will. She claims eliminating ones that don't make sense or have outlived their usefulness, but to make sure that the benefits are then will be adopted, outweigh the cost. I also directed a review of agency operations, seeking recommendations on how to make the agency more open, efficient, and effective. And we launched a data innovation initiative to make sure that our data operations, what we call, how we analyze it, and how we make it public, if it's public, to make sure that our data operations are the right ones to the information page. From day one, our team at the SEC has been focused on ensuring that our rules and processes are creating a healthy climate for private investment and innovation, in our important space, and smartly empowering consumers. And so I welcome President Obama's executive order from last January, calling on all executive departments and agencies to review rules and regulations and ensure they're designed, as Tom pointed out, in a cost effective manner, consistent with goals of promoting economic growth, innovation, competitiveness, and job creation. The President's order was consistent with the philosophy we were already applying at the FCC, so although the executive order didn't want to turn a file to the FCC, which is the independent agency, I directed the heads of the Commission Bureau that ought to be set up in a manner consistent with the principles. We had already conducted the perspective reviews and incorporated the benefit analysis into our decision making and we're funding more. In July, we heard President Nixon's executive order requesting that independent agencies act in accordance with the principle of the first executive order and called on independent agencies to develop a plan for retrospective analysis of significant rules. I welcome that executive order as well. It's important that the FCC review our major rules regularly. We operate in the fast moving world of telecommunication. The changes in technology occur in real time. In our world, both the companies and the FCC stand in still and mean even better. Let me describe the key findings of our plan for retrospective analysis, which we're publishing online today, and our efforts to eliminate requirements for possible modify rules that need to be improved internal practices. These efforts are removing legal burdens on industry, enabling the agency to effectively promote competition and power consumers, and they are unleashing investment and innovation across the broadband economy. As I mentioned, the broadband economy is a growth factor in our otherwise struggling economy. As part of our ongoing efforts to review the rules on the books, the FCC, since I've gotten there, has eliminated 190 obsolete regulations. And as a result of our data innovation initiative, we've identified 25 data collections that we're dealing with. We've already taken steps to eliminate seven of those data collections, and we're in the process of evaluating one in 18 for elimination. In addition to the rules and data collections we've gotten rid of, the regulatory review was released today with multiple examples of substantive rules we've modified or are in the process of modifying to eliminate needless regulatory reforms. I'll highlight a few here, starting with some of the process of changes in technology. Thus, the biggest area where changes in technology require a rethinking of FCC rules is mobile communication. The world is only there are now more active cell phones in the U.S. than there are people, and the majority of new phones being activated each day are smartphones. In fact, mobile broadband is being adopted faster than any computing platform in history, creating a uniquely powerful platform for innovation and job creation. All this mobile innovation relies on spectrum, our airways, our invisible infrastructure that's necessary for mobile communication. And it's all because the demand for spectrum to broadband is rapidly outstripping the cost. The community is more spectrum available for broadband and the food efficiency of the food. The roughly 300 megahertz of spectrum in the TV band is among the most robust spectrum available, the huge type property. But by virtue of decades old allocations, much of the value of the spectrum goes unused and beyond that. 
In November 2010, the Commission initiated a the focus on the preliminary steps necessary to enable the of the of the TV data to mobile broadband. We might be also paved the way for the state of the a new idea for the international national broadband that the market is supposed to be allocated to the most value by all licensed holders like broadband. To all are part of the spectrum and the key departments and systems. We urge Congress to adopt the proposal for the National Broadband Plan for voluntary and incentive options so that we can move forward with these market based options in a free up spectrum to flexible broadband needs. That initiative has passed the same Commerce Committee by a bipartisan and overwhelming 21 to 1 for both, and it's been hopeful that it will become law this year. I'm also concerned about the negative effects on the mobile economy and mobile consumers that the government can come up. That we can see we've been able to consistent with our authority. We've freed up that into mobile broadband, both license and license, primarily by removing restrictions on spectrum use. These reforms will help the U.S. maintain its position as the world leader in mobile innovation. They help alleviate spectrum crunch which is the biggest threat to the vital to vital growth sector of our country. And this section of reviews in our world also demonstrated that our country's landline work system needs to be updated to the mobile generation. Right now, if you're in an emergency situation and you're black, you can't send a text to 911. You can't send a photo from your smartphone or a video. It doesn't make any sense. We've been looking to rule to accelerate the development and deployment of next generation 911 technology. These reforms will empower first responders and save lives. The Commission has also made it a priority to remove barriers to broadband infrastructure deployment. The cost of obtaining permits and at least in full attachment and right away can amount to 20% of the cost of fiber deployment. Last year, at the FCC, we adopted a top cost. Key local review of tower and antenna applications. Smart creative way to reduce regulatory barriers to broadband buildup. Really, this year, we streamlined the process to substantially reduce the cost of attaching wire, wired and wireless equipment to utility buildings. And we adopted an order in August of this year to remove barriers to use construction for wireless backup. It will help accelerate the deployment of 4G networks across the country. Now, just think about some things that probably will drive those over uh, backlogs in power sharing and coal attachments and wireless backlog. This is a blood and guts work that the FCC should do if you want to move private investment from the sidelines to the streets and enable companies to put people to work. It's do so by building out our broadband infrastructure, which in turn drives more economic growth. So we've also removed regulatory barriers and programs the FCC overseas. Last year we took action to eliminate unnecessary restrictions that prevented schools and libraries from using e-rate funds in the most cost-effective way possible, including for unused fiber lines already in the ground, and to open up the computer facilities after school hours to get news and review our work. We identified two distinct ways in which there were e rate regulations that didn't make sense, and we eliminated it. A large category of regulatory reforms about the cover could be described as, if it's safe, that's it. The SEC is under a congressional directive to spur competition and innovation in the cable section of the market. The Commission previously selected the cable card and made due for the detail. But under the old rule, it's the more difficult for consumers to use set top boxes from the retail than to use boxes used from the cable operator. Only a tiny fraction of cable subscribers chosen to buy a set top box. They have only a handful of boxes. That's why in October 2010, the Commission adopted changes to remedy the shortcomings in cable programs, including keeping the experience with retail set top boxes and reduce burden on cable operators. Another example. Our video relay service program, which provides vital communications for people who are deaf or hard of hearing, suffered from serious fraud and abuse. 
And our view of that, our view of that led to our institution of the forms of this program that have already been taxpayers approximately $250 million. So we need to make a major reform of existing rules. When it responds to the emergence of broadband and mobile technology, the commission very recently to modernize the universal service fund and the related to the carrier competition system in the IPC. Together, the FCC and the state use UFS, the IPC, more academic, a very big program in the UFS, that we're in the UFS, as well as the complex system that is to bring basic telephone service to areas where the population is too scattered, the geography to advance to the terrain too difficult for private companies to comfortably invest in building out telephone network infrastructure. But you as well can ask them to help the nation meet our commitment to making telephone service available to all Americans in the Chinese country. But the program has accumulated widespread inefficiencies and waste to remain focused on traditional telephone service even though we need to be learning. We fail to account for the fact that broadband is the indispensable infrastructure of our 21st century economy, essential for jobs, for education, for health care, for access to global markets. And the multi billion dollar intercarrier competition system of BBC or Peak System and regulated payments among carriers to the exchange of phone traffic, misaligned and hundreds and hundreds of competition and communication services. In the last several years, policymakers from across the political spectrum and stakeholders from every part of the communication and marketplace openly acknowledged that U.S. and FCC and FCC were broken and needed to be updated. But complexity, inertia, and powerful impact failed all the time to overhaul these programs and the status quo continued. Two weeks ago, some of the other the FCC unanimously and on a bipartisan basis approved the once in a generation overhaul of the Universal Service Fund in an area competition, reaffirming America's Universal Service commitment to the digital age. Over the next decade, these reforms will use targeted, accountable public private partnerships to help extend broadband infrastructure to the approximately 18 million Americans who would currently live in areas without access to the the question is very important to mobile broadband. We established a new mobility fund that will expand 4G mobile broadband to tens of thousands of mobile, for millions of people work with and travel, including dedicated support to travel areas. And for the first time in the history of the Investor Service Fund, we'll be using market based mechanisms to distribute funding. Like the mobility fund reverse auction, in which providers seeking to serve different areas of the country will compete against each other to cover the most unfair road miles at the lowest cost to the fund. By using smart, market based policies and cutting waste and efficiency, we're able to transform the FS while cutting the fund and its firm budget. I thought you could change the size of what had been a growing program, which is ultimately paid for by consumers. But the steel form also eliminates billions of dollars in human subsidies to consumers' wireless and wireless and phone bills to make more robust wireless service for people on the distance calling and remove obstacles to modern, digital, efficient networks and the increase in the nation they make it. The reform we adopted a massive modernization, updating of our rules, a massive elimination of rules that no longer make sense. Will drive massive economic benefits in rural America, and it will also expand the online marketplace nationwide, enabling the private sector to create jobs and start and grow businesses across the country. So, for today's forum on regulatory reform, I know an important lesson of the FCC's U.S. and FCC reform. How do you want to do our work? It's critical to our ultimate success. We made our decisions based on facts and data gathered in one of the most expensive records in the FCC history. Including hearings and workshops across the country and more than 2,700 sensitive comments totaling tens of thousands of pages. We calibrated the policies we adopted and maximized consumer benefits. We were also careful to ensure that affected companies and predictable and measured transition paths so we can keep investing in the network to better serve consumers and support our business. And we brought increased clarity 
areas of uncertainty. We need that tension to be nuclear safety services like voice, voice of the internet protocol, tensions between lazy technology and old world. On top of universal service reform and all of the other reforms I mentioned, we still have a number of less effective reviews on tax. We plan to move forward early next year with the next step with our review of the Commission's experimental radio licensing policy. We can streamline that process. The Commission's design and rules of this that might remove impediments to the development of dynamic tech and access technology, which will allow for more efficient the Commission is moving forward with the proceeding design to protect consumers and fraudulent charges on their telephone bill, which is commonly called phone. We'll be undertaking a comprehensive review of the Commission's secret standards for cable television service in response to changes in cable television systems technology. We'll be continuing the review required by our staff, quite properly, including the annual review of rules that have a significant economic impact on the world and other small businesses. By the annual review of telecommunications regulations and the quasi annual review of broadcast services. The final and most effective review of the FCC is a living document, which will be updated in response to comments and reviews from the public, as well as to reflect the Commission's ongoing and effective review of significant regulations. Consistent with the President's executive order, we've also proactively explored creating alternatives to the so let me highlight a policy solution where, thanks to an open dialogue between the Commission and stakeholders, we were able to fix a real problem without new regulation. It's happening on something called Bullshot. Bullshot is an app where the wireless subscribers experience a sudden, unexpected increase in their monthly debt. Common cases are when a subscriber is charged for unknowingly exceeding the data limits for voice, text, or data, or get hit with unexpected international learning charges. Roughly one in five Americans with cell phone plans were victims of this stock last year, many receiving hundreds of dollars in overage charges and some even receiving thousands. The good news is we think from the start is that there's a simple technological solution to the problem. Mobile carriers can just send consumers alerts when the consumer starts to receive a monthly limit for a basket of hits with the national running party. The head of the Wireless Industry Association stood with me and a leader from Consumer Union to announce that all mobile carriers would send the alerts to consumers for free, automatically, with no option to buy. The today report on the FCC regulatory review focuses on our modification to safety regulations, but I think it's important to note that this work complements meaningful efforts to improve FCC processes. The FCC has significantly reduced commission backlog, including an 89% reduction in satellite licensing applications and a 30% reduction in broadcast licensing applications. We significantly reduced the time between the vote and the commission decision, such as the rulemaking order, and the release of the full text of the decision. We can take an average of 14 calendar days after a vote for the commission to release the full text of the decision. The major orders would take weeks or months to be released in order to finalize and document the process. Now our coverage is down to three days, and the majority of students are released within one day of the commission's vote. We have closed with the FCC in the last two years 199 dockets. About one third of the commission's open docket of the Most notably, we're using technology to improve engagement with outside stakeholders. Improving both the information we provide to and the key from the public. For the first time in a decade, we overhauled the SBC website. That website has actually won the award for best website in the late 1990s. And uh, it was just the way it was. That was the only way it was done in technology. So, we reformed it after a careful process to look into the real needs of all the various stakeholders uh, who engaged with the SBC. So now it's the first website that makes government data available in format that can help us with the world innovative applications, including making all application programming interfaces or APIs available for developers. This key goes to new ground by including in the public record comments received from non traditional avenues, 